Thank you, team. That was phenomenal tonight. Amazing. Been thinking a lot about seasons recently, and I know we're heading into a whole lot of different spaces. I mean, there's the different season represented by all of us in this room, and then there's the different season we're moving into as a church. There's a different season taking place for us as a Hills campus here. And uh, I got to tell you, it's one of the things that's been the most exciting about moving to New York is just how different the seasons look. Uh, When you get to winter, it's just absolutely bare. All the trees have no leaves. It looks like everything is dead. And then snow falls and covers the ground and it feels like you've stepped into Narnia and it looks amazing. And then you come into spring and everything is budding and it's beautiful. And then you come into summer and everything is just absolutely hot and you forget that and and it confuses me to be honest as an Australian how something could be that hot but also be a place where it snows in winter and I still haven't figured that out and then you get to fall and everything turns these beautiful shades of different colors and it's absolutely spectacular you get these really marked changes of seasons And I was thinking about that. We've been thinking about what it means to walk through different seasons and how to do some of that well, how to to go through seasons where you feel like you're stuck. I don't know if you've ever been there and you get through a season, you get to a season where you feel like, "I'm I'm just stuck in this season. I grew up five minutes down the road. Uh, in a little spot called Crestwood in Borkham Hills. And uh, I grew up there since, uh, since about 1985. We started coming to our church in about 85, 86. And so in a couple of years' time, it'll be like my... A long time since I've been coming to this church. And, uh, and I know I look, I look super young. I don't anymore, actually. I've got so much gray coming through. It doesn't, uh, doesn't hide a thing. And I grew up just playing with my brother, like all the time. Uh, we got two younger brothers, and we used to play everything. We used to play cricket. We used to play tennis. Uh, we used to invent games if we didn't have anything with us to play. Like, we just played all the time. Uh, the one thing that we didn't ever do was sit around and talk about our feelings. Uh, it just never was something that came up with me and my brothers. We just never sat around and talked about, hey, I'm, I'm feeling this right now and I'm going through this. We just never, we just never really talked like that. We just, we just played all the time. And so when it came to how to talk about things or how to be able to look at where I'm at or be able to express myself, it wasn't something that I ever had a vocabulary for. But it's one of the things that becomes necessary as we journey into what God has for us and as we find ourselves transitioning from season to season. In John chapter 20, verses 24 to 29, we catch up with a guy named Thomas. And Thomas is a skeptic. Thomas is the kind of guy who has a lot of questions. Thomas is the guy who's tracking with all of the things that are going on in Jesus' ministry and he's preaching and he's not just happy to be there and soak up the atmosphere. Thomas is like, yes, but... (laughs) And Thomas had loads of questions. And I wanted to pick up on where Thomas is at because Thomas finds himself in a place where he's stuck. Thomas finds himself in a place where he's full of grief. Thomas finds himself in a place where others are moving on and he still has a whole lot going on that he has some doubts about. In fact, we call him, and I think unjustly so, we call him Doubting Thomas. But in John chapter 20 and verse 24, it says, But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So Jesus appears to all of the disciples except Thomas. Thomas is not in the room that day. And it says, so the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. Now, I don't know if you've got any friends like that, And they take a thought and then they just take it to an extreme. And you're like, I can track with what you're saying here, Thomas, but it's a little bit gross. I mean, it's just a little bit extreme. Uh, You don't actually need to put your finger right in the mark of the nails where Jesus had nails. I mean, it's just a little bit too much. Um, But here's the thing. Everybody else got to see Jesus. Thomas wasn't in the room. Thomas is still living in the midst of doubt and grief. He's like, Jesus, did you really rise again from the dead? Jesus, could it really be possible? 
And then everybody else gets to see Jesus risen again and Thomas isn't in the room. Now, I don't know if Thomas just needed to go for a walk to clear his head. I don't know if Thomas just found himself in the midst of grief going, I I just need some time. I just need a moment by myself. But it is in that moment that Jesus appears to show everyone, I am really risen again from the dead. And so Thomas finds himself stuck. The Bible goes on to say a week later. So for a whole week, Thomas, who's already the guy who has lots of questions, he's already a skeptic. He's already what he likes to call a realist when everyone else is overly optimistic. That guy for a week is surrounded by his friends that have seen something that he hasn't seen. And he's not willing to just go along with the crowd because he has done that before. And now he is going to give full vent to all of his questions. Interestingly, Thomas is still in the room. (laughs) He's got all of his questions. He's got all of his hesitations, but he's still there. And it says a week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet come to believe. One of the things I love about this passage is that the doors were locked and the disciples were hiding They were in hiding because Jesus had been killed. And what happens in Rome in those days is if you are following a guy that is, everyone else is going, look, this is the Messiah. We need to follow him. And Rome gets wind of it and they kill the leader. The next next people they come for are the followers. So they're in hiding, scared for their lives. That's why the door is shut. They feel like they're locked away. They feel like they're in a place where they are stuck. But Jesus has a way of making his way into the stuck places in our life. And if you are here tonight and you feel like you're in a place where you are stuck by circumstance, by emotion, by things that have gone on in your world and you feel like you are unable to move forward, well, we serve a God who makes it a specialty to make His way into the locked places of our lives and reveal Himself right there in the midst of it all. I'm praying and believing that tonight we might have an encounter with God like Thomas did, that He might make Himself known and shown to us. If you're looking for a title, it's simply this, what to do with doubt. What to do with doubt. To give us a bit of an insight into what Thomas's character was like, uh, there's a couple of verses where we encounter Thomas in the book of John, apart from this one. One is in John chapter 11, and Thomas says this, Thomas, who was called a twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Jesus has just been saying, I need to go raise Lazarus from the dead. He's in Bethany. The disciples say to him, we shouldn't go there because uh, last time you were there, people were trying to kill you. And if you go there again, they will finish the job. And Jesus says to them, no, 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 we need to go. He's not just sleeping. Uh, He's actually dead. I'm going to go and raise our friend Lazarus from the dead. And Thomas's response to all of that is, all right, guys, well, We might as well go with him and die with him. Like that's the kind of, that's the faith of Thomas. He's like, this is all going to be terrible, but we're going to be with you anyway, Jesus. I kind of like him. I'm like, I I get that guy. That's the guy that I can follow. So he's he's a realist. He's not willing to just go with all of the positivity around him. He's the kind of guy that walks into place and goes, "Mm, everyone's way too happy here. I don't know what, it's not something wrong with this place. I don't, I don't understand it. I can't get my head around it, but he's still there. John chapter 14, Jesus is preaching to his disciples and he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Everyone else I can imagine is sitting around Jesus going, Jesus, you're such an amazing teacher. Just to be in your aura makes me feel better. I feel comforted. I mean, just, just so wise. Like everyone else is just in there, just soaking up the ambience. And, and Thomas is like, what are you guys all on? Like, Jesus, this is literally what Thomas says. Thomas says to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Thomas is the one to put up his hand and go, Jesus, this, this sounds beautiful. You've got a beautiful tenor to your voice and it makes us all a little bit sleepy. I mean, it's fantastic, but Jesus, you haven't said where you're going and we have no idea where that is. And if we don't know where you're going, how can we know the way? Essentially, Jesus, none of what you are saying makes sense. And Jesus, on the other side of that, brings a great revelation of what he is actually thinking about. But Thomas is the one who has no hesitation in bringing to the forefront, this is what I am wrestling with. This is my question. These are my doubts. And now we found Thomas and that Jesus has died. Everyone else has seen that Jesus has died. And I think there's a couple of things that we discover about Thomas that can help us in the midst of the seasons that we move through, that can help us when we find ourselves stuck that can help us when we find ourselves in the midst of doubt. And the first is this, Jesus hears Thomas. Now I know it sounds super simple, but Jesus hears Thomas. Jesus doesn't just hear Thomas saying, I love you. Jesus doesn't just hear Thomas worshiping him. Jesus doesn't just hear Thomas glorifying him. Jesus hears Thomas crying out saying, hey, I can't believe unless I put my finger in the place where the nails went in his hand. Jesus hears even that. And we've cleaned up the way that we approach God to the point where we feel like we can't bring the rawness of our experience before him. We somehow feel guilty like we are being ungrateful if we come to God and say, hey, this is where I'm really at. These are the questions I really have. This is the doubt I'm really wrestling with. And yet Jesus hears Thomas. Sometimes we hear those words that Jesus says and he says, you know, you, you, you've seen and so you believe. Blessed are those who, who don't see, but will believe. And we sometimes think that Jesus is scolding Thomas, like you should have believed anyway, Thomas. But I don't think that's what Jesus is doing at all. Because the very group that Jesus is speaking to, they've all seen. Jesus showed all of them. Jesus appeared to all of them before he even appeared to Thomas. Is, Jesus knew that Thomas wasn't gonna be in the room. Of all the things that seem unfair in the Bible, this has to be right up there with him. Jesus knows that Thomas is a skeptic. He knows that Thomas is gonna have questions. Of all the people that needed to see Jesus the first time he appeared, that's the guy you make sure is in the room. But Jesus knew that Thomas, through wrestling with some of his questions, was going to do something profound, not just for Thomas, but for us. Jesus hears Thomas. Eugene Peterson says, the Psalms were the prayer book of Israel. They were the prayer book of Jesus and they are the prayer book of the church. Over a third of the Psalms are what are called Psalms of lament. They are Psalms where there is an outpouring of grief, where there is an outpouring of doubt, where there's an outpouring of confusion, where there's an outpouring of anger. Some of those Psalms I read and I think, Man, David must have been having a really, really bad day. I can't pray that psalm. I mean, David is calling out for vengeance on his enemies that God would strike them all dead. I'm like, that just doesn't seem godly to me. And yet God so knows the condition of our heart that he gives us the capacity to pray some things that we don't even feel the right to pray anymore. And we hesitate to come before God and say, God, this is really where I'm at. And this is really what I'm thinking. 
And this is really what's going on in my heart. But God shows us that we can pray like that. Some of us feel like it's almost unchristian to bring our raw and honest thoughts to God. We've graduated from the doubts of Thomas. We've graduated from the questions of Job or from the deconstruction of Ecclesiastes or from the sorrow of the Psalms. And yet God invites us to meet with Him authentically. When God appears before Abraham and Sarah and tells them you are going to have a child. I mean, they, the Bible says they were well advanced in age, like well past the ability to have children in the natural and the Bible records that Sarah hears these words. She's in the tent, in the doorway of the tent, and she hears these words and she laughs. I think she laughs because she's protecting herself. You don't get your hopes up about the big hope that you had that has been dashed and is clearly not going to come to pass. I mean, you don't get your hopes up about that in a moment. And so she laughs. And the Lord says to Abraham, how come, how come Sarah laughed? And Sarah says, I, I didn't laugh. That wasn't me. I wasn't laughing. And, and the Lord says, you did laugh. I mean, it's this weird kind of interaction. I mean, it sounds like my children most days of the week. I didn't say, you did say that. I didn't, don't, don't, I mean, it's just, but I think what God is doing is he's driving for the authentic Sarah. He's driving to say, hey, Sarah, I'm not gonna let you off the hook for laughing here because I actually want the laughing you to come to the front. I want the laughing you that is too afraid to believe the word that I'm saying. That's the one that I wanna have an encounter with because if you can be real about that, then we can see something transform. God wanted a Sarah to know, hey, you are laughing right now out of preservation but you are gonna come a time in your life where you're gonna be laughing out of the fulfillment of the promise. And so God comes to meet with each and every one of us and invites us to meet with Him right where we're at. We think we gotta clean ourselves up or get it sorted out before we can come to God. But He wants to meet us right where we're at. There's no other way to encounter Him. There's a rabbi by the name of Chaim Potok, and he talks about the tradition of being in a service, in a synagogue, and walking to the ark at the front of the synagogue and opening it up and just yelling at the ark, just yelling out of your frustration and anger and grief and just yelling at the ark until at some point the rabbi comes and puts his arm around your shoulder and gently kind of moves you away. That's enough, enough yelling at the ark. We're not going to have an ark at the front today for us to all come and yell at, but he says this about that ancient practice. He says, you shout out of faith, not because you don't have any faith. If you don't have any faith, you don't have anyone to shout at. We sometimes think to ourselves it's a faithless act to come before God and express all of where we are at right now. And we need to work through all of that stuff before we come back to God. But God wants to meet us right where we're at. It takes faith to honestly come before God and say, Lord, this is what I want to see. Your hands and the mark in your nails, show me that so I can believe. God wants to meet us right there. There are two pitfalls in the road that we're called to walk. One is that we never take the opportunity to express where we're really at. In some ways, we're always presenting a false self before God. The other is that we learn to express our doubts and our confusion and our challenge, but we don't follow the full progression of the Psalms of Lament. The Psalms of Lament start with grief and frustration and anger, but they always move towards hope. They move towards confidence in God. They move towards trust that He will be faithful to His promise and He will be present. I pray that we might engage like the Psalms do. There is a priest by the name of Ron Rollheiser, and he gives us an interesting framework that I have found helpful when it comes to processing a change of season, when it comes to moving forward, when we feel like we have been stuck, when it comes to being able to grieve the past. And he compares 
these five things to the five stages that we encounter in the Bible from the death of Jesus through to the coming of Pentecost. And he says this about what the disciples were going through then because they had known Jesus a certain way. They had walked with him. They had talked with him. They would sat around the campfire with him. But now they were going to know God, but not the way they had known God before. And so he says this about that transition for them. The first thing he says is that you have to name your deaths. Some of us are so eager to find the positive outcome in everything that we never take the time to actually say, God, that's a death in my life. That's something that has passed. That's something that was precious. That's something that meant a lot. That isn't there the same way anymore. And we need to learn to name our deaths. The second thing he says is if we can name our deaths, then we can claim our births. And there's the new thing that God is doing. And there's the new thing he's wanting to do in and through us. And as long as we are connected to the old, as long as we haven't acknowledged what's past, we can't claim our births. And then he says the third thing, we have to grieve what we have lost and adjust to the new reality. That's the disciples in the 40 days when Jesus has risen again from the dead. They're claiming their births, but now they have to grieve what they've lost, the old way that they knew him, and adjust to the new reality, adjust to the new thing that God is doing. The fourth thing he says is do not cling to the old, but let it ascend and give you its blessing. When it came to ascension, they had to be able to let Jesus go and let his presence with them for the last three years that they had be a blessing in their life. There are some seasons we need to come out the other side of and at some point be able to let go and allow that season for what it was to be a blessing to our life in order that we can step forward into what God has for us. And the fifth and the final thing he says when we come into Pentecost is we need to accept the Spirit for the life that you are in fact living. If we have named our deaths and claimed our births and adjusted to a new reality and let some things go and allow them to bless us, now we have open hands to receive the Spirit for what God is calling us into next. And I pray that for all of us, regardless of where you might be on your personal walk, we might be able to move forward with His Spirit for the life He's called us to live. The second thing we encounter in this passage, the first is that Jesus hears Thomas. The second is that Thomas sees Jesus. Thomas sees Jesus. It's interesting to me that Jesus still has scars. There's a lot that comes with trying to imagine the future that we are called to be a part of. There is no part of the Bible that seems to indicate that we're somewhere up in the clouds in some kind of spirit existence, but everything about Scripture points towards a physical resurrection, a bodily resurrection. Now, that resurrected body is something that has been transformed, so it's not the same as we have right now, but it's transformed in some ways that are powerful. And so in a transformed body, of all the things that I don't want, there's going to be a lid. I mean, there's some injuries that I'm carrying. <laughs> there's some hamstring issues I have when I try to run fast. There's this shoulder that kind of you know, clicks a little bit still. There's this ankle that I broke two weeks before my wedding in this car park. We won't go into that story. That's for another time. And, and there are all these things that I want to see healed in my transformed, resurrected body. But Jesus appears before his disciples and Jesus still has scars. Jesus doesn't have to have scars, but Jesus still has scars. And Thomas sees Jesus. It's significant that Jesus has scars. It tells us something about what he has been through. It tells us something about what he knows. Don Carson suggests that Jesus having scars is an indication to us that, that Jesus knows what we are going through. He knows our challenges. 
He doesn't just know our challenges like He knows everything else. It's not just because He is all-knowing and because He is God. He knows our challenges in a way that supersedes that or is greater than that because He has experienced those challenges as one of us. There was a young girl at the front of the stage here during worship and she was worshiping and it was amazing and I looked up at one stage and she just had her hand in the air and had a cast on her hand and she was reaching out to worship God with a, with a broken arm and we see things like that and we identify that because we all recognize the brokenness in us and yet sometimes we don't recognize that God reaches out to us with scars in his hand. He reaches out to us with his own brokenness and there is something profoundly reassuring about worshiping a God who has scars. Edward Shalido is a poet and in 1919, right after World War I, he was writing uh, a, a poem about Jesus of the scars and he was connecting with Jesus' scars in a way that as a society, he suggests they hadn't connected with before. He was saying, now that we've seen the horrors of trench warfare, now that we've seen the horrors of this many people dying on this kind of scale, now that we have people in our cities that are, that are maimed and mourning, now we identify with a Jesus that has scars. And at the end of his poem, he says this, the other gods were strong, but thou wast weak. They rode, but thou didst stumble to a throne. But to our wounds, only God's wounds can speak. And not a God has wounds, but thou alone. There are a lot of gods that people have served and have worshipped over the years, but not a God has wounds, but the Lord Jesus Christ alone. And Jesus appears to Thomas with his scars. Jesus still has scars. They proclaim to Thomas and to us, I know what it's like to go through grief. I know what it's like to be in confusion. I know what it's like to feel rejected and isolated and alone. These scars are the proof. Come and see that these scars are not just the proof that it's really me, but come and see that these scars are the proof that I've been where you are. And these scars are evidence that He can't just make it into the locked places of our heart, but there is a way out for us. There is a way out of the places where we feel locked. There is a way out for the places where we feel stuck. There is a way through. And Jesus' scars show us the way to the resurrection. Isaiah 53 and verse 5 says, but he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Soon after we got to New York, I sat in a, in a course called Emotionally Healthy Relationships. And part of that course was to be able to sit with your partner. It didn't have to be your spouse. It was my spouse in this instance and be able to engage in an exercise called incarnational listening. And the idea was that I would express what I was feeling to my wife and then she would reciprocate that in her own words or in my words so that I felt like it had been heard. I I'd never felt more heard in my life. And what was difficult for me is I didn't have the words to communicate what those feelings were to start with. And so to kind of help a bunch of us along, and we were on a Zoom call with hundreds of other pastors, and I sat there and watched as this one young man started to enter this exercise with his wife. And he was brave enough to, in front of all of us, start to share his feelings, start to share what was going on in his own life. He talked about how he was passionate about his family, he talked about how sorrowful he was at the state of his dad's health. He talked about how excited and glad he was to be going to a game with his brothers. He talked about how guilty he felt that his dad wasn't able to come when that had been their tradition. 
And as I listened to this man, I, I mean, I'd never seen a man be able to talk about emotions like that. I'd never opened myself up to the fact that there may be that many emotions all going on at the same time. It was wild. And yet, as I started to be able to bring these things, I started to be able to bring them not just to my wife, but to be able to bring them before God. And start to be able to not just bring them before God, but see that God had been where I have. And that there is a way forward. Of all the characters in and amongst the disciples, I think I identify with Thomas because he had the capacity to question some things. And he had a natural tendency towards being skeptical. N.T. Wright draws our attention to the way that John begins his gospel account. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was light, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. He starts his gospel account talking about God. And then he takes us on this journey and, to and shows us what it's like when God comes to live among men. And he says, this is, he starts off talking about God. And then he says, this is how God acts. This is how God speaks. This is how God operates in community. This is how God walks the earth. And then he comes right back around to where he started, that Jesus is God. And guess whose mouth he puts those words in? The guy that we call Doubting Thomas is the one that has one of the most powerful professions of faith in all of the gospel accounts. It's Thomas that greets Jesus' appearance with these words, my Lord and my God. Jesus is acknowledged by Thomas, not just as a good teacher, not just as a wise man, not just as a good revolutionary leader, but Jesus is God and it's Thomas that sees Jesus because we can start out skeptical and we can bring our doubts and we can carry our griefs and we can come through to the point where God is able to transform it all and reveal Himself. Tradition has it that Thomas goes to India, and that Thomas carries the gospel to India. In fact, the church in India still attributes its origins to the apostle Thomas. Tradition has it that Thomas dies in India, and that Thomas is speared to death with a spear in his side, the same way he reached out his hand once to feel Jesus' side. Tradition also has it that Thomas didn't want to go to India, and that he complained about it. Uh, and that he was like, it's too far, I'm not well enough, I'm too weak for that kind of journey, so some things never change. But Thomas has a revelation of Jesus and goes in obedience. And I don't know where you find yourself tonight. I don't know if you find yourself in a place like Thomas where maybe you feel a bit stuck. But I know that God is able to appear in the midst of the locked places in our hearts, even the places that we have lost the key to and have no way out under our own steam, He is able. I'm going to invite the team to come back up and we're going to spend a moment and believe to have an encounter with God. Thomas says to Jesus, um, Jesus, we, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus replies to Thomas and says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. We have those words of Jesus because Thomas had some questions. And we are all recipients of the faith of a man that was willing to bring himself authentically before God and cry out. And I wonder today if we might be able to have an encounter like Thomas did. Can we close our eyes for a moment and right where you're sitting, maybe hold out your hands. 
ready to receive. And I wonder if you could take yourself to that place, that part of you, maybe it's an overwhelming part of your life where you feel stuck, where you feel like there is an inability to move forward, where you feel like those disciples, you're locked away behind a closed door. I know it's not easy for many of us to locate ourselves in that place. But I wonder if we could go there for a moment in his presence. And Lord, we thank you that you are with us. Even in the places of our heart where we feel like we are unable to move forward. Lord, be it grief be it doubt, be it the challenges around us, be it the way we question our own ability. Lord, meet us there like you met Thomas. I wonder if you could take a moment and imagine for a moment Jesus appearing before you like Jesus appeared before Thomas. I wonder if you could picture Jesus appearing in your locked space, showing his hands, identifying with your pain. And then Jesus begins to speak. Can we take a moment and imagine Jesus speaking to us? What is Jesus saying to you tonight? before you Lord would you come and present a way forward in all the ways in which we can't even see a way forward ourselves Lord may we find comfort in your scars and may we find assurance for all that you have promised that they mean to us we pray, Lord, for healing. Lord, that you would heal broken hearts. That we might know the comfort that you promised and spoke about. Holy Spirit, come. Even now, let the warmth of your presence fill us. Let us become acutely aware of your love in us, around us, through us. church 
I want to pray for us, and we're going to worship a bit and believe to encounter Him. I wonder as a moment, as, as we linger in His presence, um, if you're here and you, in particular you feel like you are just so stuck with where you're at, and you're believing for breakthrough, you're believing for a way forward, we're going to pray and believe that tonight might be a, a starting point or a turning point or a significant point in that journey of moving forward into all that God has for you. Can we close our eyes for one moment? If you're saying, yeah, that's me, I felt so stuck and I'm believing that tonight would be a turning point. Tonight might be an encounter with God and His presence and a revelation of Jesus that might change things. Maybe it's stuck in ways of being and ways of reacting. Maybe it's stuck in attitudes or perceptions. Maybe it's stuck in mindsets. But you know God has something for you. There's some people in this room and there's a hesitation to even want to believe anything could be good or any kind of good news. And God's wanting to do a work in our hearts. So if that's you and you're feeling a sense of being stuck tonight. Why don't you raise your hands and we're going to pray. Father, we pray, Lord, in every place where we're reaching out to you. Lord, may we see your scarred hands reaching out to us. Lord, we pray that where we have stopped even hoping that something might change. God, we pray that we might encounter your presence afresh. Lord, that hope might rise, that hope might rise in our hearts, that hope might again be present in our outlook, that hope might again be present in the way that we view the future, that there might be hope again, that the Lord might visit this kind of happiness upon us, that we might once again know joy or know it for the very first time. Spirit, come and deposit in us a righteous hope for all that You are calling our lives into. Bring about Your transformation in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, let's worship for a moment.
on your toe. And... God loves you. He loves you so much. We're going to take a moment and just pray for anyone in this room who you find yourself in church for whatever reason tonight. You just know that your life's not right with God. Maybe you've grown up going to a Christian school or a Sunday school. Maybe your parents have had some kind of faith. Maybe your grandparents, you know, were praying for you. But if you're honest with yourself, there's a real disconnect between you and God's plan and God's purposes for your life. Or maybe you're here tonight and you've never known what it's like to have a real relationship with God. Maybe it's one of your very first times in church. Maybe your first time today. But you recognize that you need to get your life right with God, that you need to make your peace with Him. Most of us growing up, tend to believe that if we can just live good lives, if we can do good things, then one day when we stand before God, He'll accept us because we've been good. But the Bible makes it so clear, there's nothing good that we can do to make ourselves right with God. And if instead of having our faith in ourselves and our own ability to be good, we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and everything that He accomplished for us on a cross 2,000 years ago through His life, and death and resurrection, if we put our faith in Jesus instead of ourselves, then the Bible says that God Himself will come into our life. He'll forgive us of everything wrong we've ever done. He'll wipe the slate completely clean. He'll remove the need for us to live under any kind of guilt or shame or condemnation. He'll take those things away and give us a brand new start today and His purposes and His promise and His peace and His forgiveness for our future. All over this place, could we have heads bowed and eyes closed with every single person in prayer, considering where you stand before God? And if you're saying, yeah, that's me, I need to get my life right with God, I need to make my peace with Him. Then we're going to pray a simple but a powerful prayer. Prayer putting our faith in Jesus. If that's you tonight, I'm simply going to ask, on the count of three, would you along with every other person in this room, would you simply say, yeah, that's me, I need that prayer for me. Tonight, right where you're standing, if that's you, would you just raise your hand on the count of three? You're saying, yeah, include me in that prayer. I need to get my life right with God. Are you ready? On three, lift them straight up in the air. One, two, three. Lift them up. You're saying, yeah, that's me. How wonderful. Yeah, amazing, amazing. God bless you. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Brilliant, yeah. How beautiful is that? So incredible. We're going to pray this prayer. It's a prayer putting our faith in Jesus, and especially if you're raising your hand tonight. In fact, could we all maybe place our hand upon our heart as we pray this together? We're all going to pray this together, but especially if you know you need to get your life right with God, as we pray this prayer, would you pray it as well? And not just as a religious formality, would you pray it from your heart? Let's pray together. Dear God, right now, I accept you into my heart. Lord, I don't want to live my own way anymore. I want to follow you. Come and be my Lord and my Savior and my greatest friend in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Come on, can we celebrate that decision that people are making tonight? How incredible is that? Tyler, why don't you come on back up? You know, if you did make that decision, we'd love to put one of these gifts in your hand. It's a New Testament Bible and uh, 
If you start in the book of John, where we were tonight, that's a high recommend. That's a good place to start. Three books in, the book of John, four books in. I know my Bible. <laughs> the book of John. And uh, we know that as you read it, God's going to continue to reveal Himself and His great plans and purposes for your life. And so on your way out through the foyer, some of our team will be there just holding these up in the air just to make it really obvious where to come and just confidently walk up and just say, hey, I prayed that prayer. And we'll put one of these gifts in your hand and uh, take it, put today's date in it, but put it somewhere where you're going to be able to read it so that God can continue to reveal Himself to you and His plans and purposes for your life. Can we celebrate one more time every single person that made that decision tonight? How incredible.